so that in Georgia, really partially because of Doug and some of the people that, uh, that uh, were around him and some of the people who were uh, with him and some really thought leaders on their own, there are three separate programs that treat healthcare professionals. And no other city has three healthcare professional treatment programs that get folks from other parts of the country as much as these three programs. And as I said, I've run two of them, some people say into the ground, but uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever. And, uh, and then the third one I, I was able to, to uh, do some consulting with. So I know in these intimately, and I've learned lessons about how to run treatment because this is the model that, um, that, that, uh, that I think is going to be so helpful for rivermen. It's a model that not, not only works with, by the way, healthcare professionals, but the other group that uh, Garrett's heavily involved with, and I am as well, is the airline pilots. And the airline pilots also have very similar rates. We took a look, I was just at the HIMSS conference, and saw that their rates of recovery were startlingly the same, down to not only the, the total number of people that had positive urine screens over a five-year period, but also what happens to the small percentage that do have a positive urine screen uh, only half of those have a second positive urine screen. So they're looking at, you know, if you look at those two data, the outcome would be about an 85 to 90% recovery rate. So uh, let's talk about program number one. This was a program that was developed in the early days of professional health programs um, and strongly focused on 12-step recovery skills. They, they saw this as their central point. Um, they um, believed to a large degree that um, addiction was a complex illness, but at its core was a spiritual disorder. Um, over time, what happened was drift. Uh, the program began to de-emphasize physician involvement um, and the treatment of comorbid conditions, including um, depressive illnesses, uh, bipolar illnesses, uh, monopolar illnesses, um, and, um, and to, in my belief, also the characterological issues that go along with addiction. Uh, one of the joys of working with people that are very highly skilled people that are substance abusers is that you get skills in dealing with every single um, access to diagnosis even if they don't have them because they all show up looking like they do. <laughs> um, so over time what happened with this program is they started cutting down on the amount of physician hours involved in the program. They had a medical director who was very opinionated, who left, they had a bit of a battle with this individual over the way things would go. She eventually left and moved out to Utah, actually. Um, and um, after that, what happened is they began to drift. And what's happened with them is they become a marginalized player in this market. Um, they, they do very good work. Uh, they do very good work with a certain group of people, but they don't do well with all types of comers. So the second type of program I'm going to tell you about is, uh, uh, is located in a large, freestanding, not-for-profit hospital. It's actually the largest not-for-profit hosp uh, independent hospital in the southeastern part of the United States. It had a historical emphasis on figuring out how to blend private pay and insurance reimbursement. That was its history. Um, physician involvement in this particular program is strong and has always remained strong, uh, but they have an open medical staff where, depending on who your attending physician is, the treatment tends to vary widely. Um, what happened with this institution is in an effort to ensure survival, they began focusing more and more on managed care contracts, and there was this schism between, um, between the managed care patients and the patients who had to stay for longer periods of time, the professionals. And they were all, the, the professionals were always saying, why, why do I have to stay longer than these people? And the people that were staying for a shorter period of time said, why can't I stay as long as these people so I can get better? And that created this kind of undercurrent at the institution. What happened over, what, and this is also a larger hospital, and, and referrals are very difficult um, to get into the program, and the professionals felt un unfortunately singled out. They began to say, the only reason I'm staying here longer is because I'm a doctor, and not because, and we kept on trying to say when I was running the program, this is not because you're a doctor, but you get the benefit of more definitive care. Um, but that schism created difficulties because you're admixing in two oddly very different populations. So the next program is program number three. It's located on a distributed campus, uh, much like uh, Dr. Angris was talking about. 
Uh, housing is a 15 minute ride from the center. Um, it's also of note that the uh, drive from the housing to the center is through one of the largest areas of uh, crack and heroin use in the city, um, which is somewhat problematic. It has had a sufficient medical staff to keep a balance between addiction care and the treatment of the comorbid conditions. In fact, when I came there, um, the combined, there were six full-time physicians for 90 patients, and I had the uh, uh, dubious responsibility of trying to supervise six physicians the combined um, uh, years of uh, addiction treatment uh, in that group was over 120. Mm -hmm. So we had this really rich bench of very skilled providers, uh, uh, addiction psychiatrists that knew how to have an admixture of um, treating comorbid conditions, but also a big, strong, firm basis on um, uh, of, uh, based in, in recovery and the fact that uh, addiction is a primary illness. What happened in that institution is extremely tight corporate-driven staffing patterns led to an unbelievable turnover. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, the turnover in, in the uh, clinical staff was one to two years, and um, the therapist didn't experience, they would walk in after maybe having two years of experience as treatment providers and have to sit across the table from the uh, chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery from a major institution, and you know, that was a difficult process. It, the turnover, in, in turn, also induced this, this sort of ill will. And I will tell you, one of the things about taking care of healthcare professionals is that the market is a really small group of people who have this elephantine institutional memory about treatment providers. And so what happened is the ill will with this institution caused difficulties. But despite that fact, because they had a cohesive focus, a strong medical staff, people kept on referring to them. So what are the lessons from this? Um, careful attention to comorbid conditions, including personality and psychodynamic issues. I often tell people that if you have people in residential care for more than two months, you often wind up spending time getting into very complex uh, personality disorder issues and psychodynamic issues even because once people are sober, you can start working on very interesting issues that are underneath the surface, not causative of addiction, but highly contributory. We also know that if you mix professional patients with the general addiction care, especially if there is a managed care, get them in and out in a week. I remember one of my managed care contract people had me admit a patient to day hospitalization, and I said, well, how many days are you proving? He said, one. I'm already over. <laughs> you, you said you one. Too. No, you it's it. Garrett. Garrett. Oh, right. Okay. So one is the warning. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys are slow learners. <laughs> we are. Okay. Now, sh hush. I'm, you're using up my time. Okay. This is a rough crowd. Okay. So, an experienced center staff, with lots of time, is essential, and the professional treatment market is a small insightful and tightly knit mar market with an elephantine memory. I now refer to these institutions and know all the major players, and that's a problem. Okay, so I've, um, let me t tell you a little bit about the Riverman treatment model, uh, and, and as far as treatment, what happens is uh, there's a group of us that have been working on this uh, uh, type of treatment that's called recovery mind training. We've been working on it for about eight or nine years. Um, I started uh, doing the patient manual, and then I saw on Amazon that um, my friend Dr. Angris had written this book called, po called Positive Sobriety. I ordered the manual, and he was reading my mind. So it was incredible how what he was doing was so close to what we were doing. The basics of the River Riverman model for treatment of addiction is that addiction is a disorder, which is addiction treatment is basically complex learning. And I love Steve Hyman's article, Addiction, a Disease of Learning and Memory. And that what we have to do is retrain people how to live in recovery, and it is essentially uh, antithetical to how they see their lives, how they think in their lives. And so this retraining takes time. Um, but when you tell a patient, what we have to do is teach you how to live your life differently, that's different than what we're currently doing. And the division in terms of in this uh, recovery mind training is that all of the, the, the consolidation of all of the effects of 
alcohol and drugs on not only the reward center, but the memory circuitry, the motivational circuitry, and yes, the ability to see the fact that the illness is present, we could solve those, those two and, and, and to addict brain. And then the, re, the antidote for this process is called recovery mind training, which is a series of, one more slide and I'll do that, uh, which is a series of domains of care that you have to go over to help people get better. Um, it combines 12-step recovery with CBT, with dialectical behavioral therapy and other techniques, and I'm out of time. Thank you.